as we read in the Psalms recently, David said, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, because your law is in my heart. Amen. Tell someone we delight to do his will. In the words of Jesus, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Amen. So as we come to him, we can extol the virtues of his word once again because this has been our focus in our reading of the Psalms recently, daily. How many people are loving the Psalms? Loving the Psalms, amen. Loving the word of the Lord. It's been so refreshing. It's been like taking a cold shower on a very hot day. Every time you open that book and you just pour out the truth of God's word and it shapes your prayer, it shapes your attitudes and dispositions towards in the course of the day. God's word is amazing. Amen. Um, it's the bestseller. Tell someone it's the bestseller. It really is. And after all, God wrote it just for us. He wrote it just for us. Amen. His word.
and high five someone and say it's all about his glory
about His glory. Tell someone all about His glory. Amen. All about His glory. All about His honor. All about His praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
stones will crumble and riches will fade, but the word of God will reign. And the church of Christ will say, the Come on, lift those hands and say, magnify. The word is, the word will be forever and ever. The word was, the word is, the word will be forever and ever. Oh, we praise your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Come on, thank him for his word, church. It's pure, it's holy, it's reliable, it's faithful. Thank you for your word. Shape and fashion. 
sing that third verse again. Lift your hands and sing it. Speak. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. trust Him. It gives direction. It's our GPS for life. Circumscribes boundaries for us. Sets the landmarks of our movements, our attitudes, our actions. That word is powerful. Tell someone that word is powerful. In Exodus, God said, I sent my word and I healed you, Israel. The healing there is not just physical. While the context relates to physical infirmity, but the word healing is in the Hebrew and in the Greek, it's all encompassing. It's it's body, soul, and spirit. Anything that is not in ease is diseased. If it's out of ease, it's diseased. And if you are facing something that is not in ease, if it's this is not in rest, God is able to align and God is able to correct and God is able to bring it to its proper synchrony with his intent and his divine will in the heavens. Now God's word can do that. God's will, God, call it God's will is the synchronizing. God's word is the synchronizing agent. Everybody do this? Okay. He has your life. He has God's, God's will for you. Everyone now do this. Say synchrony. What brings this is the power of the word. The word's able to do exactly that. It brings us back to order. Everyone say back to order in 2024. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now we're trusting God for many that will just do that and experience that divine alignment and synchrony. There are many trusting God for physical uh, healing of one kind or another. And I want to encourage you that God is able. Everyone say, the God that healed me.
Church, these chains, these chains are set. You're the God, the God that healed 
me you're the God that you're the Father, speak to us. Let your word do its full, complete work in us and through us. Father, let there be an establishment, a foundation of your word that is in our lives, that as we would walk by faith, that you walk with us. So, Father, we raise up our faith, we raise up our voices, we raise up our lives because we can stand on the authority and the power of your word. So, we bless you. We honor you. We are so privileged to have your word within our lives, within our midst. We say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Father, we do say again, we believe. We believe. Father, everything your word says, every promise that you have, you have declared, Father, we believe that it will come to pass. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, greetings in Jesus' name as we come around the word of the Lord together table let's go to Isaiah chapter 43 Isaiah chapter 43 I'm reading from the ESV version reading from verse number one the Bible says but now thus says the Lord he who created you O Jacob and he who formed you O Israel fear not for I have redeemed you I have called you by name and you are mine they shall not overwhelm, shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, as your ransom, Cush and Seba in charge, in change for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honor, and I love you. I gave men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Hallelujah. I will bring your offerings from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the people's assembling. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witness to prove them right. And let them hear and say, it is true. Verse number 10. You are my witness, declares the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me. And understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no Savior. I declare and saved and proclaimed when there was no stranger, strange God among you. And you are my witness, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, therefore, I am He. There is none who can deliver you from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One, of Israel for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice I am the Lord your holy one the creator of Israel your king thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea a path in the mighty waters who brings forth chariots and horses armies and warrior they lie down they they cannot rise and they are extinguished quenched like a wick Verse number 18, remember not the former things, mm. nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated for a few moments.
Well, greetings this morning, and so good to see you all. As we would say, compliments of the season. What an exciting time to be alive, amen? I want to encourage us this morning as we come around the table of the Lord, just for a few moments, because I really believe as we've been speak, uh, singing prophetically the songs uh, this, uh, in, our, in our time of worship, in regards to placing the word primary within our lives, And there's another enlightenment, and I think a a reminder of how important the Word of God must be central within our lives. Mm -hmm. It must be central. It is the fulcrum, it is the hub, it is the epicenter of our existence. Nothing goes outside and operates outside the very ambit of of the very Word of God. And I think that is so important. And as we come around the table, a powerful portion of Scripture that we've read, a prophetic utterance, that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, which I think even as we would launch into this new year, uh, we can draw some, some, some encouraging thoughts. And just three things I just want to, to highlight from this portion of scripture that can colorate our time around the table of the Lord, of how God establishes himself within your life, within our lives, but secondly, he also affirms himself of who he is to you as well as there's a response from you and I. And I heard that prophetic word uh, that Randolph was speaking, and it just jumped in my spirit, alignment. What is our response to the establishment of what God has set on the earth? What is our response to how God has affirmed certain things within your life? There's got to be an alignment and a divine positioning in, in accordance to the word that can bring us to the very promises that we so desire. Amen. This year according to the world's trajectory, as we see it, is upside down, inside out. Mm. Come on now. There's war everywhere. There's killing. There's death. The financial sectors don't know whether the money is going up or going down. This year, there's things that we cannot control. There's things that that we, we can't control what's happening in Ukraine. We can't control what's happening right now in the Middle East. There's so much that is taking place. We can't control the earthquakes and the tsunamis that are happening across the world, the devastation, and so many other things that are out of our control. But we know that that is the world we're living in. So there's got to be a stance and a position that we can adopt. And I want to encourage us as we come around this word. When you read Isaiah, God does something very prolific for us. He establishes the fact that He is still God. Mm. Come on, I want you to know this. Whatever tsunami you're going through, whatever earthquake is now rumbling somewhere in your life, God is still in control. Amen. Yes, there might be more rumors. Now, I, I just saw the news the other day that Korea now is also wanting to fight with South Korea and North Korea. Also, it's on edge. They're firing missiles. And, and they just saw the news again that now they, fire, they fired about 400 missiles into Israel from Palestine. The war is intensifying. Mm. And those things, right now you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm here in KZN, Durban. Who knows me? Hamas, do they know me? It doesn't affect me. And it does. It does. Now, watch this here. The Bible says in that context that God says, I'm going to establish who I am. I am God. And this is a fact that I believe for you and I, we need to... We need to appropriate within our spirits. But secondly, he also affirms. He affirms us. And he says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Three times in the context of the scripture, he says, fear not. And I'm so, so glad we're saying in that, that fear and doubt will no longer be our preserve. Mm. We can enter into 2024 with a, an excitement. And, and even though there is war, even though there's a sound of the thief that is at the door, we will not fear. Amen. We will not fear. God said that to Joshua. He says, do not fear. Don't be discouraged. Be of good, of good cheer. Mm. And then just very quickly, I just want to highlight our response. God has established himself. And how is he doing that? A reminder this morning is through his word. Come on, how is your word? The question is, have you been faithful in reading Psalms? Mm. Now the church goes quiet. He says this in verse number 18 and verse 19. Very familiar portion of scripture that I want us just to draw in regards to the table. Because this is our response. He says, 
Do not call to mind the former things. The ESV says it. Do not remember the former things. If you haven't realized by now, 2023 is over. Yes? But there might be tailings and residue of circumstances and situations, emotions, feelings, thoughts, dreams, desires that are still hanging in the balance that God is saying in this new season that, listen, he says, do not call them to mind. Do not remember them. Do not go to a place where you're going to say, I'm going to sit down and just remember and, and, and gravel in my, in, my, in, 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 in my pain of 2023. Yes, we made mistakes. Okay, I'm the only one. I made mistakes in 2023. But I'm not taking those mistakes in 2024. It says, and I love this, the qualification is this. Do not call to mind the former things. God qualifies this. Then he says, do not ponder upon the things of the past. He says, forgetting the things which are behind. Don't even consider them, the ESV will say. The principle is this. God has established us in such a way that we don't have to go back. I know you've been hurt. Come on, we got to get over those things. And how do we get over them? Through the word. Through the word. Then listen to what God says in the B part of that. He says, behold. I love that word, behold. Because behold speaks of two things. In the Hebrew, it's very pictorial. And it speaks not just only of a sight. When it says behold, it's not only speaking of to look. It's speaking of to take a hold of. So it has, when we're saying, what is God going to do is not what we're just only going to see, but what we can appropriate. The things that you so desire in 2024, mm. we are going to now not only just see it, but we are going to have it. Come on, I say prophetically even in regards to our building. Mm. This can't linger on and on and on. This can't just go on and on and just say, yes, we're going to get there. Yes, our building. Yes, it, we see it. Yes, amen. We perceive it. But we've got to take a hold of it. How do we take a hold of it? There is an appropriation of the word of God that by our lifestyle. Come on now. It says, and what I, I like what it says is, Behold, God is now saying this. I will do something new. Come on. Some, I know some of you already say this year I'm going to do new things. That's nice to say that, but let God do it for you. Let God do it for you. Mm -hmm. I will do a new thing. And when God does it, what's the response? It will spring forth. The Greek word hello my or the Hebrew word hello my speaks of one that springs up, that comes in aggression, that comes in your face, mm -hmm. that you will know it, that you know it's God. Then he says, I will do a new thing and it will spring forth. And I love the word spring because it speaks of a launching. You know what God is going to do for us, please? Let's, you know, sometimes we pray and our prayers are, I know God is going to answer and we just keep it in the back of our minds. We're asking God for things to jump in our face, to come in front of us, to spring forth. Then it says, will not, and when it springs forth, will you not be aware of it? You will know it that it's God. Mm. Come on, if you ever want to know that God is working in your life, this is a season. This is a time. He says, then he says now, in the midst of all that is going to take place, he says to you and I, I will make. And I love that word make because you go back to the creational order in Genesis chapter 1 where God says God created. The word make is also the word creation because it's also qualified in verse 26 where God said let us make man. God is about to bring a formation, a structure. I think it's Psalm 139 verse, verse 14 verse 15 where we are fearfully and wonderfully made, the next verse says, God has intricately woven us together. He has formed our innermost being. God has made you. That is why in Deuteronomy, you'll say he has given you the authority to create power, to make. God is going to form us in this season. The formation is how? Through your obedience and alignment to or in the word of God. And it says, I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. How does that colorate to the table this morning? Christ did this for us at the cross. Amen. That we can have access to all of this. God's establishment of who he is. God's affirmation of what he thinks of you. And our response is simply because the cross 
Jesus died for us. He arose for you and I. And right now, he's alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for that very need, that prayer that you have, that very thing that you're going through right now. It's not left alone. Mm. And Jesus, and God says it in that word. He says, I will never leave you. I will make a way where there seems to be no way. So this morning, as we come around the table of the Lord, I'm excited this year, 2024. I'm going to rise up with my faith. I will not be discouraged. Yes, the enemy might come in like a flood. The enemy might come in, but God will raise a standard. And what is the standard? The standard is the word of God. If there's ever a time to get through what you need to get through right now, let's get back to the word. Come on, let's get back to the word. Love the word. Like Jeremiah said, I rolled it up and I did eat it. It became like fire shut up in my bones. It's the word of God that breaks every yoke of bondage. It's the word of God that gives you access to all that you so desire. It's God's word. That is our response to the table, to the, to, to, to the cross that Jesus did for you and I. Mm -hmm. Is that we need to respond by his word. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, for your speaking. Thank you, God, that you have installed, that you have set and established your covenant with us through your son, Jesus Christ. So as we turn to you, as we look to you, Father, we, as we look to the cross, not just only in remembrance of the suffering and of the pain and of the anguish and the ridicule, the embarrassment, but Father, we look at the cross as victory, as building up our faith in you that the things that we will face even though we might be on the mountains of Golgotha a place called skull with a stench of death yet we will still rise up again and, and live father I pray Lord this morning that you will do a new thing in our midst in our lives within this household of faith and it will spring forth it will spring forth and we will know it we will perceive it and understand that it is you thank you Lord for your son, Jesus Christ, that has given us this access, that has given us the ability, Father, to enter into this relationship with you through your word. So we acknowledge, Father, you said in your word, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and he prayed and he gave it to his disciples. And he took the cup and he blessed it and they drank. And he said this, do this in remembrance. In remembrance. Father, reconnect us again by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's receive together. Let's stand. We're going to receive the offerings. We want to encourage you to give liberally unto the Lord. Amen. And freely, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let's give with our hearts in our offerings. Amen. Let's just sing that old song. I know the plans I have for you. I know just what you go.
Father, we thank you that we can forget the former things. For behold, you do a new thing, and will we not perceive it? Thank you that your plans are good plans for each of us. Good plans for this house, Father. In your name, I bless this house. I bless every person, every son of God present here today. Thank you, O oh God, for the newness of a new day, a new season. Thank you that the former things have passed away and we will not ponder them. We will not call them to mind. For behold, and we want to see and hold the new thing. Appropriate the new thing that you would do among us. Do your will, let your will prevail for every single one. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon you, church. May the Lord indeed bless you and your house and all that attends you. The Lord bless you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of His countenance. The Lord give you His peace. Amen. You may be seated. Well, okay. Welcome everybody to the Father's house. A very happy 2024. Um, so welcome to all of you and to all our visitors and our online viewers. Um, I have a few names. If you could please stand as we would give you a Gate Ministries warm welcome. Uh, we have Vernon, Selwyn, Yolanda, Noel, and Shiloh. If you could stand. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause. Welcome. This is your father's house, so enjoy the presence of the Lord. So last but not least, we have a special announcement. Wesley and Janine gave birth to baby girl Shy on the 5th of January. You can see their picture up here, so faithful father. The announcements for the week are as follows. We have no midweek services or meetings this week. However, on Friday morning at 5.30, we will meet for prayer via Zoom. So please join us as we seek the Lord together and pray over his will concerning our lives personally and corporately. Next Sunday, we will meet again at this venue at 8.15. And we continue with our daily readings in the book of Psalms. I trust you are all enjoying that. And today's reading is chapter 75 and 76 this evening. A forthcoming attraction 
from the 16th to the 18th of January and the following week, which is the 23rd to the 25th of January, we will be fasting and praying corporately. So on those days, we will be having Zoom meetings, which will take place in the mornings from 5.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. After church today, we are having a time of fellowship and tea, so please stay. Our visitors are free to join us, feel welcome, and spend some time in fellowship. Lastly, we would like to wish the following people a very happy birthday. So Newman, Jaden Beru, Jaden Pale, who celebrates today, and Alika, a very happy birthday to all of you. We pray that God will be gracious to you, bless you, and cause his face to shine upon you. All right, and lastly, <laughs> we would like to pa welcome Pastor Randolph, who will be sharing the word of the Lord with us. So if we can all stand and say it together, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, good morning. Amen. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Um, there's no Sunday school today. We will resume the kids' ministry from next week um, in the adjacent room next to us. But just for today, the kids, you stuck with me. Okay, you have to listen to me today. So a warm welcome. Welcome to Westland, your family there. Wonderful to have you. Um, and some other visitors Yes. Um, when, are you, when do you guys go back, um, Rudy? Okay. Still got time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so gl glad to have uh, Doreen, Auntie Doreen, with us, Fiona's mom. Uh, very special to us, dear friend of us and of the ministry. So always good to have you present with us. Who else did I miss? Selwyn, you and your family, wonderful to have you. Um, someone's my sparring partner. <laughs> we do good together at the gym. And uh, yesterday we were boxing together using one, one uh, what they call those things? Whichever. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, today is the first Sunday of 2024. And we're seamlessly going to continue in um, the focus on prayer that we have started a few weeks ago. Today represents part six in the series, but the second part of a subsection which we're entitling Meditative Prayer. And um, this is probably for me one of the most important aspects of prayer to speak about because it really starts to center um, the mind and how you should focus in and when you do start to pray. We all want to pray effectively. We all want to ensure that when we spend time in prayer, it's productive. It counts. It's not vacuous. It's not futile. It's not empty. The psalmist we see, we read in one of the psalms recently in the week, that God, he was thankful for the fact that God has not rejected his prayer. Prayer can be rejected if it's done wrongly, with wrong motivation, um, or with the wrong internal disposition. If it's done with selfish motivation, self-indulgence, God can reject it. His ears are open to the prayers of the, of the righteous. It's not prayer that's effective. It's the prayer of the righteous man that is effective. Right? That's what James teaches, the prayer of the righteous man. So we mustn't make an idol of the activity and of, of prayer itself as a concept. It's the state of the prayer. It's the state of the man who prays that makes the activity effective before God. And so what we, were, what we are attempting to do is discuss principles relative to prayer that really make it effective in, um, in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, I said to you last week that 
Paul said this, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the, and I will pray with the mind. Okay, verse 15. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. If the mind is to be employed in the matter of prayer, the mind has got to be meditated. The mind's matter, the mind's content, the mind must be given attention to the state of the mind, the set of the mind, or we call it a mindset. What, what is the thinking? What is the prevailing disposition or the mentality of the person praying when he enters the realm of prayer? Because, yes, you do pray, like I taught last week, by the Holy Ghost, who is at one with your spirit, state of mind, if you're going to pray effectively. And for me, the meditated mind makes prayer effective. Prayer becomes effective when the mind of the man or woman that, me- that prays is a meditated mind marinated in the principles of God's Word. So I take my mind and I ruminate, I cogitate. Right? I reflect, I ponder, I mull over, I, I turn things upside down, I churn them inside out. That's what the word meditate literally means. I revolve it over and over, look at it from all angles. Right? I, I, I literally baptize my mind and I pickle, everyone say pickle. You pickle your mind or you marinate your mind in the Bible, in thoughts from God's word. So that when you set yourself to pray, guess what comes out of your mouth? Principles from God's Word. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth is employed in speaking in prayer. But it's only a reflection of the state or the content of what's in your heart. And I want to encourage you this morning. Your heart must be filled with the Word of the Lord. Your heart and your mind. Everyone say heart and your mind. Heart is another synonym, some believe, for spirit and mind for soul in that context. But I want to encourage you, both, di- both dimensions of your being must be filled with God's word so that you can pray the word of the Lord effectively. A quick reminder, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer with thanks giving, let your requests be made known to God. Anxiety befalls the mind. Anxiety, fear about the future, fear or anxiety, fretting about this and that, befalls the mind. It's an attack on the mind of the person. You start to think out of the bounds that God has prescribed for you because of fear, uncertainty. I know we're all prone at some level to this spirit of anxiety. It befalls everybody, but the instruction is, everyone say it's an instruction. This is not a suggestion. The instruction is be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. So you can pray about everything. Tell your neighbor you can pray about everything. This is everything by prayer, no matter what concerns you. You can bring it to God in prayer to bring your mind back to alignment. Because the unprayed mind is prone to anxiety. The mind must be meditated in God's word so that it can pray effectively. What I'm suggesting to you is that when the meditated mind marinated or pickled in God's word, when that person prays, it's the antidote to fear. It's the antidote to fretting. It's the antidote to anxiety. So you can have an anxiety-free life. Is that possible? Is that a tall order to to live anxious, free, anxiety-free? Shouldn't that, is that your goal, your ideal this year? I want to have an anxiety-free year, right? The Bible says of the man who fears the Lord in Psalm 112, that even when he gets bad news, he doesn't fear. Because his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. The Proverbs 31 uh, woman says she smiles at the future. 
right? No matter what awaits us, Sean alluded to calamities present in the earth that are set to escalate. Things will get worse and worse. So you'll be constantly hearing bad news. It's almost impossible to look at social media of any kind today and not hear or let bad news be fed into your spirit. And you must guard what you receive into your system, right? You must guard what you receive into your system. We get back to the verse, be anxious for nothing but in everything by, by prayer. It's everything by prayer. I love that phrase, just that phrase. Say everything by prayer. Uh, that's the, like, if you want a caption, uh, status update, everything by prayer. Everyone say everything by prayer. It's like nothing without prayer, but everything by prayer. God will do nothing except it be done by prayer. God waits for prayer before he does. Prayer and supplication with thanks, giving, let your requests be made known to God. And the result is verse 7, and the peace of God... Uh, which passes all comprehension, what will it do to the heart and the mind? Come on, it guards the heart and it guards the mind. Last week I shared with you the Greek word literally means it acts as a sentinel. It watches over your, your heart and your mind. It's like a, some version, some Greek scholars say it's a garrison, a fortress kind of protective thing that you build up around two elements. Your heart and your mind can be guarded or watched over. It is done by the peace of God. If there's something you're going to need this year, it's going to be the peace of God. Because the peace of God is your authority. Peace is not some tranquil. Yes, it is. It's tranquility. It's ease. There's repose. There's rest. You're even killed. You're not easily dislodged or unseated. You have a sense of being. You're not easily thrown. You have internal peace. Who needs more peace? Yes, we do, right? We all need the peace of God. Now, the peace of God is the kingdom's governmental authority. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and Joy in the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 9 verse 6, of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no, there will be no, no end. What is Jesus? Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, right? And in, in the Hebrew framing, that is the one who has authority to destroy the power of him, the enemy, that seeks to establish disorder. So just watch, and I told you this, I want to go to the mechanics of it. If I say you are a man of peace, I think somebody's at the door. If I say that you are a man of peace, right? Everyone say man of peace. That peace is an authority within you that dismantles Satan's power. When Jesus stood and he said, peace be still to the raging waves and seas that threatened the well-being of his disciples. He's not just saying peace, calm. That peace is an authoritative declaration to neutralize a brewing storm that is intent or was intent on taking the lives of his disciples. Remember how they feared in the boat? But he stood up and he said, peace. Now that's authority. Okay. Paul, in every single one of his epistles, starts like this. Grace. We know about grace. Eh? But now you must bring the other dimension too. He says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be yours. Be, be given to you. And here Paul says, you get to that place by prayer. Everyone say by prayer. Prayer is my peace place. If we want to, another descriptor. Everyone say prayer is my peace place. When I'm thrown, when I'm decentered, when anxiety threatens, when I tend to be unseated when after I prayed, I settle. I recenter. And I want to encourage you all, find your peace. Let the peace of God protect both your heart and mind within the context of everything by prayer. Say it with me, everything by prayer. Say this, everything by prayer and nothing without it. Right? Not one plan must be made without praying. 
right? Everything by prayer and nothing without it, right? We must be a praying church, a praying community, okay? Now, the word, just quickly from last week, the word, one of the words for meditate is chaseb. I said to you last week, right? Um, and it means to weave or to plait, to plait like hair, three strands come together, keeps the hair ordered, Whose hair needs some ordering? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keeps the hair ordered so that it doesn't fly all over the place. That's what a plait does. Okay. So when we plait or plait, I don't know how you pronounce it, plait, is it? Plait the mind. The word meditate means to plait the mind. It's to take its various strands and to interweave and interpenetrate it. That's what the word means, to interpenetrate, to permeate it with the Word of God. The Word of God and your meditation on it is how you plait your mind. Right? Ask your neighbors, your mind plated, plated today. <laughs> right? The other word is sikha. And sikha for meditate literally means to meditate. It means to meditate. Here's the strictest definition of sikha. If you know meditation, there are three broad words in Hebrew. The one is, like I mentioned, Joseph. The other one is Sika. But the most often word used, translated, meditate in English from the Hebrew is a word called Haga. Everyone say Haga. I'll talk to that in a moment. But so Joseph means to, when you think of meditate, things I'm plaiting. I'm plaiting my thoughts so that it's not disoriented, easily dislodged, distracted. I am focused, right? I have a meditated mind. Are you not finding, church, that the focus currently on the reading of the Psalms is doing just that? Right? My last thought before I sleep is a psalm. My first thought as I wake up is the next psalm. It's the first thing on my mind in the day. It's the last thought on my mind before I, before I sleep. It's my meditation throughout the day. I'm plaiting my mind. Because when I kneel before God to pray, guess what? is going to infuse my mind and my words as I pray to God. It's the very things I have read. It's the very things I have, the principles I have meditated upon. So sika, one of the words for meditate, literally means to pray. The word meditate is an for, in fact, meditation is a form of prayer. Right? It's literally a, a form of prayer that is, for me, is one of the most very powerful words for uh, forms of, of praying, is to meditate on the word. Now, haga, one of the Hebrew words for meditate, the most uh, common, the most often used. In fact, it's more frequent than the other two. The other two feature scarcely here and there. And if you have a good concordance, you will, you, you'll know exactly where they're found in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. But most often, Whenever you read meditate in the Old Testament, invariably it would be the Hebrew word haga. And this is what it means. To ponder, to imagine. Everyone say imagine. To groan, to sigh, to mutter, to speak. It literally means to talk, to roar within. Right? To utter sounds. Now, this is so uncommon to those in the West, but Eastern cultures and Hebrew cultures know this. For us, it's a foreign thing. If I say meditate uh, to you versus meditate to a Jew or maybe to someone from the East, they will say, yes, I'll meditate, and they'll take, let's say, Scripture, right? Um, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. The Lord is is my shepherd and I shall not lack. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. They'll take Every word, they'll rehearse it over the scripture over and over again. 
in low, in almost inaudible undertones, mutterings under their voice. But it's something heard. Tell your neighbor meditation is heard. That's the biblical idea. We, when we meditate, we're silent. And the mind is going. Publicly, if you want to get back to biblical methods, haga means to mutter. Everyone say, start muttering. Right? Stop complaining. <laughs> start muttering meditatively. Right? I love doing this. You take a psalm. Right? We, we enjoy it. I just love Psalm 73 recently. We enjoy that. It's just an amazing, it's an amazing portion. Verse 25, who am I I in heaven but you? And there's none on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh, many times they fail, O God. But God is the strength of my heart, and he is my portion for ever. You take just 10 minutes muttering. And it's not just, it's not just cold clinical rehearsal or repetitive sounding out of the verses. You do it thoughtfully. You do it meditatively. You do it contemplatively. You do it with an internal roar, it says, within your, within your being, right? And guess what? Whatever's in the heart will come out of the, will come out of the mouth. And actually, it starts to be a prayer. And you start to pray these things before the Lord. Is it no wonder that God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart where? From? From your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. Can you see the connection? There's a connection between meditation and the mouth. For the Hebrews, Joshua was to do exactly this. He used to haga. Everyone say haga the scriptures. Meditate. Right? So... Your husbands and your wives, when you hear your partner muttering, don't think they're going loony, talking to themselves. Well, meditation is talking to yourself. It's encouraging your, yourself in the Lord. Right? Um, you can do this in low, literally, hagar means in low, soft undertones in the voice. And I want you to practice this. Don't just think it. Say it out. Depending on your context where you are, usually when you meditate, you need a quiet place, private time with you alone. But even sometimes I find myself in a crowd and I find myself quoting the scripture or meditating. Right? And uh, I will say it under my breath. And that, uh, what I'm doing, I'm pickling my mind. Right? The Bible says you will have whatever you say. I'm pickling my mind. Right? You know, if you take mango and you put it in mango pickle, and you leave it there for, let's say, a few weeks or days, and you take the mango out of the pickle. Well, it's impossible to take the pickle out of the mango after that. The mango has changed constitution. It's impossible to return the mango to the original state. So when I say pickle your mind, take the mind and marinate it so that it's laced, it's infused with the flavors of God's precious word. When you open your mouth, what comes out? Just the word. When you set your mind to pray, what is the predominant thoughts in your heart? It's, the, it's simply the words of the Lord. The words of the Lord. The word of the Lord. There are a bunch of scriptures here that connect mind and mouth in meditation. But because of time, I'm going to go through all of it. Um, there's a lovely verse that I like particularly in Psalm 62 and verse 11. It says, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Now, it is interesting. God speaks once, he hears twice. How does faith come? Say hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Say it again, hearing and hearing. So one hearing doesn't produce faith. It's the twofold hearing. It's hearing and hearing. You've got to hear the word as often enough for it to become revelation to your spirit to generate the requisite faith that you do need. One hearing is not enough. So when you hear it the first time, it's very good to meditate upon it constantly. 
right? Over and over again. Literally, for those of you that have a New American Standard um, uh, Bible, it says in the marginal rendering of the NASB, this verse. And if you know the NASB works, if you have an NASB, 1995 edition Bible, if anything is in the marginal rendering, it means it's a reference to the original framing in the Hebrew or the Greek, right? And this verse reads like this in the original Hebrew, right? One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. That's how it frames it in the original Hebrew. One thing God speaks, two things I have, I have heard. Sometimes we don't get the fullness of what God is trying to communicate to us. Because of failure to ruminate, failure to to meditate. God can speak a singular thing to you, but your spirit can hear two things. Because in the one thing is hidden the other. And sometimes God doesn't leave it to the lazy mind simply to offload whatever is on his heart to you. He requires your, your search. Everyone say your search. right? It is the right of a king to hide a matter. I'm quoting Proverbs. But it's, sorry, it's, the, 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 sorry, it's the prerogative of God to hide a matter. But it's the right of kings to search it out. Not so? I'm just paraphrasing the verse. Right? right? God can hide a matter, but kings search it out. In this season, kingship is being redefined as those who search out truth. So God doesn't just make everything bare and open to the non-searcher, to the casual inquirer to the cursory reader of the scriptures. Just flip your pages and let me do my due diligence for today. Get the psalm over with, bang, and it's over. You're going to find nothing if you adopt that attitude. You're going to take the time. I I quoted uh, Y.E. Yoda who says, "Fast fast food is good, but it's not intended for the reading of the scriptures. The reading of the scriptures, you must take a long, good chew, he said. Everyone say, chew the scriptures, right? You know, cows are called ruminants, right? And a ruminant is one that chews cud or the grass. And the act of meditation has been akin to the, I think I sent you a picture of a cow. I'm not sure if we have it. Do we have it? Okay. This was taken, if the worship team remembers, while we were in one of the mountains in Switzerland. And we walked up there a few years ago. We were there. Uh, with Dr. Elijah Morgan, leading worship at a conference. Please excuse the, the quality of the pic, but it's been magnified several times. And we walked up this mountain, and we could hear bells everywhere. I'm thinking, Heidi, Heidi. For those of you now, I've been reading my age now. Deine Wensing die Berge. Remember? Heidi, Heidi. Da, 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 da. Di, da, da, da. Da 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 da. Heidi, hi. Who remembers Heidi? <laughs> oh, I tell you, we were youngsters and we longed for this little girl on the mountains of Switzerland and her family, all the cows. Remember, I remember that cow. She had the bell. Remember? So we were walking up, then we heard these bells and cows all over the place. Very well nourished, full-looking, healthy cows. And this particular one. You see the two in the background eating grass. And this particular one caught my attention. I wrote a caption on this at the time. It's on Facebook somewhere. On how it's ruminating. Right? The others are eating. This one's meditating, Brent. He's in a different zone altogether. Right? I think cows, they say, have four digest- digestive chambers. If my memory serves me correct. So what they would do, they would eat the grass, masticate it with saliva, and then swallow it into the first digestive chamber or stomach, first part of the stomach, of which there are four. It sits there for a while, and then after a few hours, the cow will regurgitate back to its mouth what it has swallowed in the first digestive chamber. And then they will chew again and masticate it. It then, and it doesn't rush this process. Everyone say, don't rush meditation. It doesn't rush it. It, it chews it. And then it swallows it into the second digestive chamber, or the second part of the stomach, where every part of the water is extracted from the grass, right? 
it is then regurgitated back into the mouth as pellets now. It is transformed as pellets. And there it is masticated again and then swallowed into the third and fourth digestive chambers. Right? What was the intent? The intent is to extract every possible nutrient in the grass before the grass is excreted eventually. It's called chewing the cud. Everyone say chewing the cud. Right? Say take a long good chew on God's word. <laughs> you need to take a long good chew. You might think, they say uh, an average cow can take up to 300,000 chews per day. Right? Chews per day. Right? That's a lot of chewing, brethren. Okay? Um, but the results prove when you see the quality of the milk, when you see the quality of the cheese, the process is, is worth it. And I want to encourage all of you, take a long, good chew. I want to challenge, I want to rush this. I want to challenge the house daily as you engage the scriptures. Ruminate. I officially dub you as ruminants now, all of you. You're all ruminants in the spirit. You ruminate. In fact, the word ruminate is often used as a synonym for meditate. And these animals are called ruminants, right? And I want to encourage you to keep, you, you digest the scripture. It's in your spirit. Call it back up again. You chew it again. Because there might be some powerful nutrient principle you did not access on the first chew. I'm finding God's word is so rich. Scriptures I think I knew or think I have a handle on. And suddenly you read it again. Wow, didn't see this five years ago. But now it's come alive in this respect. Has that been your experience? Right? And I'm saying if you negate the meditative process, the prayer life becomes poor. But when you engage the meditative process, the prayer life becomes governmental, becomes substantial. Now you're praying God's word back to him. And if there's anything that God respects and responds to, he responds to his precious word. Look at Psalm 5. Psalm 5 um, and verse 1. Psalm 5 and verse 1. Let's look at the King James, or maybe I think the New King James. The word groaning here is haga. Right? To groan, to sigh, to mutter. Right? But the, the New King James literally uses the word meditation. A very well-known psalm, Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. Can you see the connection between the meditation in verse 1 and the prayer in verse 2? Read it again, verse 1. Come on, you've you got to get this. Um, we are trying to empower you with principles for practice. Everyone say, practice prayer. And I'm saying, if you're not praying, you're not, you're, not, you're not in step with the current demand of God upon this house. There's a demand of God upon us all to pray more and to really find a time of intimate and personal place in praying to Him, right? Um, Ian Bounds, a hugely respected author, especially in the matter of prayer, he said, prayer cannot be learned in a classroom. Prayer can only be learned or mastered, he said, in a closet. It's not the classroom, it's the closet. In the classroom, which is this, I can teach you. You get learning and teaching in the classroom, but you master the practice in the, in the closet. Everyone say, from the classroom to the closet. Right? From this classroom, as you leave, what you must go, you, you must go and design an appropriate response to the things you have heard. Say, what am I going to do about the stuff I have heard? I'm going to master my meditative practices so I can pray more effectively. So the psalmist says, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my, my meditation. Do you know what? Do you know that you're always meditating? Just on the wrong things, most times. Do you know how much time some of you waste on scrolling through videos on social media? Do you hear if you add it up? 
in a day or a week, how much time you've spent. And, you know, every time you do that, what you're informing the mind is the, the, the sights and the images that you see are being lodged, are being lodged, are being lodged. And now you want to engage in something spiritual like prayer, and you find you can't even pray for five minutes and your time is up. Do you know what to say to God? Do you know why? Because the mind has been filled with the wrong things. Tell your neighbor, reduce your social media screen time. <laughs> Instead of getting into Facebook, get into his face. Right? Leave the Facebook, get into the book. <laughs> the Bible. I'm a social media person, you all know. Right? But I, I try to manage. Uh, it will never be an idol in my life to the degree where it subverts what I put into this mind in reference to, that's why all my listening to, uh, in my private listening to songs in my car at home, the children know, Renee knows, is on YouTube every morning we put scripture in song, the Integrity Music series, right? And we play the scriptures. Those songs are in my spirit. I find myself, if I'm working in the garden, I'm singing the word. Because what in the heart will come out through the, will come out through the, out. Please, guys, you got to stay with me because this is powerful. I'm almost dying to get to the end of this, this manual here, well, the section of it, where I will demonstrate to you how people in the Bible, because they took a scripture and they prayed it through that gave sense to a current crisis, gave answers to a current need, gave breakthrough to what was currently befalling them, all because of their focus on the practice of meditation. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Who knows the song? Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shall I hear in the morning. O oh Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto Thee, and I will look up. A song helps you to meditate. How do I know Psalm 5 from verse 1, 2, 3? I learned the song in my youth, the song. Right? It's been very close to my heart. Amen? So you've got to edit sometimes what you're listening to, what you're viewing on social media, I would say make the Word of God your obsession this year. Make it the centerpiece of your life. Make it the love of your life. Make God's Word uh, may permeate your thinking, your songs, your thoughts, your social media posts. Now look at it. May it see Word just profusely coming through. And let me tell you, when the Word is in your mind, that Word will be part and parcel of your prayer. I just love verse 3 here. My voice you will hear when? Some of you can't get up <laughs> in the morning. We're going to pray next week for three days and the following week for three days. We are fasting from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week. Then the following week, three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're going to be praying for half an hour, 5.30 to 6, just for half an hour by a Zoom, 5.30 to 6 a.m. Amen. I want to encourage you to develop a culture of early morning prayer. It's very good, right? It'll, it'll really help you in your journey in Christ. The psalmist says, my voice you will hear in the morning. Oh, Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer. I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Prayer needs a direction. The word direct here, please write this down, is arak, A-R-A-K, arak. When he says, I will direct my prayer to you. Now remember, he says, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto you will I pray. My voice you will hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct. I will arrack my prayer. Everyone do this. He says, I will direct this prayer. I'm not scattered. I'm living a directed, focused life. I will direct my prayer unto you and I will look. I will look, look up. There's another teaching on meditation, looking up. I won't go into that right now. 
right? But I will look up, right? The word arak means to arrange and to set in order or to prepare. To arrange, to set in order, and to prepare. I just feel I want to do something that relates to um, maybe an application of this. Let's take one psalm um, that we've already done very early on in this reading program. Psalm 2. Everyone say Psalm 2. Right? Now look at verse 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Now let's say you took a psalm of this nature and you were meditating on the word and you read, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds and their pieces and cast away their cords from us. Look at it again. Everyone say, read it again. I'm, I'm trying to do what you should do. One reading won't do it. Got to go back. Everyone say, chew the cud. You bring it back up again. You extract the nutrients. Let's read it again. Look at verse 1. Why do the nations rage? Because sometimes you read one thing and you miss the point. Or there's a gem there waiting for you to unearth and it bypasses you. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand. Right? Against, oh, let's go to the NASB. Sorry, um. The kings of the earth take their stand and together against the Lord and against his anointed. So what's the context here? The context is there's an uproar in the nations and there are people plotting and planning, but it's what the scriptures call a vain thing. There are kings or authority figures on the earth, actually earthly rulers or demonic hosts and principalities. It could refer to both. They're taking their stand and rulers take counsel together. There's an evil collaboration coming together of evil parties. And who who is it against? Come on, talk to me. Who is it against? It's against the Lord and against his anointed, which in context is Christ, the Son. The context reveals us if you know the rest of the song, right? So there's an evil plot against nations. Now, you might not be thinking national or corporate, you, you are, you're a private person, you have your domestic context, you're an individual, you've got your, your business or your studying, your family. You can say, what on earth has that, that psalm got to do with me? Right? But it can help you if you meditate upon it. Whenever people plot against you and they take their stand against you, this psalm will give you great encouragement. Right? And then it says in verse 3, what do they say? The, the, the evil collaborative attempts of, of, of evil powers, principalities, and or people say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. What is God's response? Is God concerned? What's God's concern? What's God's response? He who sits in the heaven, ha, 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 ha. That's God's response. Ha, 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 ha. Everyone say ha, ha. Because sometimes you need to ha, ha what you read. Okay, he says God is laughing in the heavens. Ha! Huh. God is like unperturbed, unfazed, unthreatened. It's like he's seated. He's totally confident in who he is, his purposes, and his plans. And as she says, and the Lord scoffs at them. Try what you want to. Take your stand against against me or my anointed, and you will see. Right? And 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 went with the say, it will your vase. <laughs> you will know. <laughs> right? Now go to Acts 4. We're going to be done with this just short case study. We can't go into much detail about short case study. So in Acts 4, remember in Acts 3, the man was healed. The man that sat at the gate beautiful, right? It caused a major uproar in the city. Jewish authorities were extremely angry with Peter and John specifically. And they were imprisoned, remember? They had no grounds upon which to accuse them. And they then were, after beating them, they were released. 
and they were commanded strictly and threatened not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Verse 23. Look at the response. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders uh, had said to them. So this is Peter and John. They go back to the apostles. Everyone said they go back to the group. So they go back to the church. They go back to their, their kind. They were released. They were beaten. They had um, a terrible time under the hands of these Jewish authorities. When they heard this, now the whole company starts praying. They heard the report of Peter and John, how they were threatened not to preach in the name of Jesus. They lifted up their voices. Everyone say lifted up their voices. They lifted up their voices to God with one accord and they said. Now tell someone, you've got to say something. Too many of us are not saying anything in prayer. Open your mouth and say something, brethren. Let the words come out of your mouth, right? And they start to quote scriptures. The scripture is found in Genesis 2. It's found in the same scripture in number 6. It's found in Psalm 114. Their minds were filled with what? They're about to, they're having a crisis on the ground. They're about to confront God. And the first words out of their mouth is a song. Is a verse from Numbers. Right? Can you see how the meditated mind informs prayer content? The first thing, oh Lord, it is you. It's even capitalized. And in the NASB, now this NASB works. If it's capitalized, it's a quote from the Old Covenant. Oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. Verse 25. The kings of the earth took their stand. What psalm? Talk to me. What psalm are they quoting? Psalm 2. We just read it, right? They start to quote the psalm. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His, against his Christ. Verse 27. Then they start to pray, for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant, uh, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now they pray, and now Lord, take note of their threats. Right? This is very bold praying, right? They were just threatened not to teach in his name. They remember, we have the basis to pray based on Psalm 2. The, the rulers of the earth, demonic people and hosts, are taking their stand against the Lord and His anointed. God, our prayer power is not informed by our self-preservation. We are now going to pray your will. Because your word has informed us of your will. And prayer is praying the will of the Lord to get the will of the Lord done. Everyone say boldness in prayer. I wish, I wish one thing I'm going to ask the Lord when we all get together and it's all done, maybe after the millennium sometime. So Lord, just play back a few incidences in, in history. I want to see this prayer meeting. What, what, what went on there with these apostles, right? Because you will see the outcome here. It was a, everyone say powerful time of prayer. A powerful time of prayer is informed by minds that were pickled, marinated in the Psalms. These apostles were strong in doctrine, strong in the, in the word. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. Oh, by the way, I'll do us two special sessions on imprecatory prayers. Say, say implications. Imprecatory prayer or implications when you pray judgment upon God's enemies. It's a powerful way to pray. Uh, it's for the mature. These apostles demonstrated. Take note of their threats. Now, they know the Psalms that God right now is laughing. I mean, he's looking at all of the threats of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities against the apostles, and God is having a good laugh. And, and they pitch into Psalm 2 with confidence. Take note of their threats and grant to us, your bondservants, that we might speak your word with all. Now, they were just instructed, and the Bible says they were threatened greatly, do not preach again in that name. Their prayer is based on Psalm 2, they're gathering against your anointed. Now take note of their threats. Grant to us, your bond servants, that we might speak your word with confidence. Some versions say boldness. Verse 30. While you extend your hand to heal. Remember the guy was just healed, the layman. 
previous chapter. While you extend your hand to heal, signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed. Everyone say, when they had prayed. Says, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Can you see how meditation on the word of God can shake the place where you pray? The place was shaken where this prayer was given utterance to God. God came down, infused them again, a, re, a fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost. They're filled again with the Holy Spirit as they were in Acts chapter 2. And they begin to speak the word of God with, with boldness. As I was meditating on this particular passage, the Lord said this to me, Randolph, if the church, if you as a person and the church under your care, starts to pray with minds marinated, meditated in the power of my word, I will shake too the place where they pray. The shaking is not just a physical thing. It's shaking anything to dislodge whatever power has negatively come against you, against the will of the Lord for your life. Now, it might not be a physical shaking. Maybe in this context it was. There was a literal vi vibration. But I, am, I know in my spirit that God is going to give us prayers that shake our world. Prayers that shake our situations. Prayers that shake our circumstances. Prayers that shake our bondage into freedom. Prayers that shake lack into, into provision. Prayers that shake um, ignorance into knowledge. Prayers that shake a lack of of, of, of of wisdom into actions of wisdom. Who needs prayers that shake? Now, I want to, this is a word from God to all of you. Because we have a while to go in the Psalms. Everyone say, we're journeying. Right? We're journeying in the Psalms and we're praying it every day. I say this to you and I give this to you as a prophetic word from the Lord. Um, the Lord is saying to you, the kinds of prayers that you pray now, must not be empty and vacuous, but must be prayers full with substance from my word. Because if there's anything I respond to, declares the Lord, it will be my word. I think that what caused the shaking was Psalm 2. I think when God heard his word, yo, these guys remember me, my, my, my disposition over what they are currently experiencing. You must always try to picture this. What is God's present disposition over my situation? What is God's mood? What is God's stance? What is God's posture? If you can pitch into that, you will activate a response in God. And these apostles, they pray. They pray some too. The rulers have taken action against your holy word. Now look upon your servants. Grant us confidence that we might speak the word with, with boldness. And it was the word in prayer that activated a response from heaven. And their world, their room, their world was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they actually went out and defied the authorities and began to continue to preach and teach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to pray meditatively. Everyone say pray meditatively. The meditation is a fixation, a rumination on God's Word. If you're not ruminating, you'll be agitating. To agitate is to fear, to be concerned, right? And I want to encourage you, as you master the, the, the art, I call it a discipline, the discipline, the art or the discipline of meditation, I believe you're going to see great answers to the issues that befall you in your personal life, there will be a great shaking of the Lord. Remember, um, Paul was and Silas were in prison, and they admit that the Bible says they prayed and they sang hymns, not so? And at the sound of their words, the foundations of the prison were, were shaken. And then the Bible says 
all the prison doors of all the prisoners swung open, everyone, not just Paul and Silas, everyone went free. The Philippian jailer was so concerned that he's now in serious trouble with the Romans, right, for whom he worked, right, in serious trouble that um, he asked them, men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household, you will be saved. He was talking spiritually, right? Now, in response to that response, response of Paul and Silas to God that pray the sing of hymns at midnight there was a shaking everyone say a shaking I just feel for some of you I speak as a father to you some of your context need shaking right for Paul it was jailhouse rock <laughs> right? right God literally rocked the jail right? but the amazing thing in their context you know, God was a bit dramatic, I think, over the top. Why not just blind all the guards, gently open the door, let Paul and Silas walk out and go free? Instead, he shakes the foundations of the whole, of the whole prison and doesn't just let Paul and Silas go free. Every other prisoner got a free card that day. What's that monopoly thing we Free. Get out of jail free card. Yeah? That day, everybody went free. Right? Let me just say this to you. You might be in prison for your own personal issues. And I say this to you, if you marinate your mind in the power of God's word, God's going to shake your situation such that you don't only come free, but everybody in your sphere will walk out of their prison or the imprisonment, whatever that might be, free as a bird. Such is going to be the power of prayer made by the saints whose minds are marinated in God's word, God's going to shake the place where you pray. Some of your families need shaking. Right? Some of your businesses need shaking. Some of your relationships need shaking. Some financial situations need the shaking of the Lord. I would say get into the word. Come before God. Meditate it. Right? And Echo his words to him in authority, back to him in prayer. And see God respond favorably to you and to your house. Right? An earthquake violently shook the foundations of Paul's prison. God can, can, can order the earth to quake. Right? To dislodge the foundations of your imprisonment. You see, the jail had to be destroyed. It's not just a matter of like in Peter in Acts 5, prison doors were just swung open and he walked free. But the jail was still there. In Paul's case, God destroyed the jail. Never to be imprisoned again. Some, some issues of imprisonment we cannot go back to. We need God to shake and break its foundations. Right? We need God to really, really move and set us free once and for all. I want you to lift your hands. Just stay seated. Just lift your hands in prayer. Lift your hands in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we love your word more than anything, Father. Your word is life. Your word is health to all of our flesh. Your word is wisdom to us. The counsels of your word give us hope. How we love thy law. It is our meditation all of the day. Speak your word to your servants. Your servants are listening. We love the sound of your voice. Help us to scuba dive the treasures of your precious word. Help us not to adopt a tourist mindset when we read your word, but a searching one. Help us to be explorers in the realm of the spirit as you it's your privilege to hide it, but our privilege to search it out, Father. And God, I just pray, everyone lift your hands. I pray for a spirit of wisdom. I pray for a spirit of understanding to be everybody's portion. As they read your word, I pray the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, be this, the portion of the saints, your people, in the name of Jesus. Remove the darkness, remove the blur, Remove the blindness, remove the inability to see. 
We pray the prayer of David. Open our eyes that we might see the wonderful things in thy law. Open our eyes of our understanding that we might be enlightened, O God. I pray light. pray illumination. Father, we pray this week that you will cause your face to shine upon us. Indeed, cause your face to shine upon the darkness of some circumstances. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray as your people pray, may you shake the place where they pray. May you shake that context. May you shake and unearth this lodge, foundational things that might hold your people in prison. I ask for many this week as they set their minds on searching after God, on seeking you, that they might live. I ask, oh God, that you would set not only them free, but everybody in their sphere. Father, we sense the burden of the liberty of many other people are dependent on our disposition, of our faithfulness in prayer. And Father, today we commit to reading your word more meditatively, praying more governmentally, praying more authoritatively, because now your word has informed our mind. Your word has informed our prayer. I, I commit your people to you. Pray that you lead us and guide us as we go forward um, into your will and into your purposes this year. I commit the year to you. I pray, O oh God, that every week, every month, every day of this year will be productive in the Lord. I pray, O oh God, that we forget the things which lay behind and look forward to what you're going to do in the future. Let your word go ahead of us. Let it configure um, context, realms, experiences, set up processes that we are to experience, O oh God. Lead us and guide us by the authority of your word. Your word is a light and your word is a lamp. It's a light to our pathway. Your word is a lamp to our feet. Illuminate our path. Lighten our darkness. Let your word shine over our spirits. Inform our souls, O oh God. And lead us in the way everlasting, I pray. Pray the prayer of Psalm 32, verse 8. O oh God, guide us with your eye. Lead us and guide us with your eye this year. I pray, O oh God, against any voice that is not of you, that counsels, that leads your people astray. I ask that you'd amplify singularly your voice through the power of your, of your word to our hearts in the name of Jesus. I bless you people today. I impart your peace. I pray great grace and abundant peace be the portion of your people now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You receive the word of the find many other examples. I just quoted one to you. People in the Bible.